Well, Southwest Church, friends, family, community, it's good to be able to uh, communicate with you this way, certainly uh, under different circumstances. Uh, certainly we are not able to meet as a body in one room this particular weekend, but we are committed to bringing to you uh, God's word, and even though we can't gather together, we are still very much the body, we're still very much the church, just meeting elsewhere. Before we're able to go into the message itself in our series uh, following Jesus, we wanted to uh, remind you of Southwest response, at least at this point, to the coronavirus uh, situation here in the region and in the country. Uh, at the time of this recording, it is noon on Saturday, March 14th, so I know you'll be seeing this on uh, Sunday morning. Uh, just yesterday, on Friday, Southwest leadership kind of put out a blast via email, social media, and on our website, uh, providing our immediate response. Uh, since we have you via video right now, I wanted to read just a chunk of that just so we're all on the same page and maybe provide some direction and hope going forward. So here we go. Just as a reminder, all events and activities taking place within our building, effective immediately through this coming Friday, March 20th, are canceled. Uh, this includes, but it's not limited to, small groups that meet in the building, all kids' activities like Club 45, student activities such as high school and middle school, all canceled. And certainly this decision has been made in consideration of how we can best serve and care for our church and community. That means you. We will be updating you on services and activities taking place after Friday, March 20th here at the building. And we're going to uh, be doing this on a week-by-week -week basis. Staff and leadership will continue to follow information released by the, city, the CDC, the Warren County Health District, and the Governor's Office. So moving forward, we will revise our policies and procedures appropriately. But we're going to continue to, co to communicate any updates or adjustments with our church family in a timely manner. So, once again, moving forward, the leadership of Southwest is committed to prayerfully leading us through this time with wisdom, with reason, and with responsibility. So be on the lookout for continued communication from us as the days progress. Uh, I'd like to pray on behalf of all of us, so please pray uh, along with me as far as um, this time in, in, in our nation. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we just want to lift up a prayer regarding this coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, just on the front end, we ask that you keep us safe and our community safe at this time. Uh, we had just four confirmed cases in Westchester yesterday, and maybe more have come out since the recording of this video. Uh, I just pray for safety, and not just physical safety, but uh, this is a time that's right for um, uh, panic to ensue. We just pray that you stop that right now in this very moment. And we also, uh, outside of that, we pray that as the body of Christ, as Jesus followers, that while we are being responsible ourselves, that we can have our eyes open to uh, opportunities to serve, to be your hands and feet, and not only open our eyes, but that we would fulfill the needs, uh, not just in our own family or friends, but in our neighborhoods, those we don't even know. Uh, this is a time where your church can uh, really be salt and light to the world, and we pray that you open our eyes to those situations and that we can make a difference wherever we can. Uh, outside of that, we just pray again for general protection from this virus for our own friends, our own selves, and our own families. But ultimately, we are going to trust you in the midst of this and uh, help us keep and have the faith to do so going forward. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, as far as our message series go, uh, we are in the midst of this series called Following Jesus, From Restless Wanderers to Joyful Followers. When we were planning this series, uh, we just wanted to get a back-to-basics approach as far as what does it mean to follow Jesus? And as we were planning this series as far as the discipline of following Jesus, we call it discipleship, we also wanted to cover several uh, questions, either big questions, important questions, uh, heart-touching questions that would get at the root of this thing called following Jesus. We are in the midst of week three, so we kicked this series off on March 1st. I got to uh, bring that message just titled, Answering the Question, Why Does Jesus Want Me? And if you want to answer that question, by all means, go back. That message is online. And then our senior minister, Roger Hendricks, who was on vacation this weekend with his family in Michigan, uh, last week he brought the question, the very important question, why should I follow Jesus? And once again, that message can be found online. Well, I have the pleasure, uh, maybe even the challenge, of bringing the, the weekend series or the question to the fore, why do I have to love my enemies? Now, in hearing that, you might be thinking, that seems a little outside of the realm of following Jesus, and you might even be thinking, 
whoa, where's this loving enemies thing coming from? Uh, I didn't know this was a thing. I didn't know Jesus said this. Uh, yeah, spoiler alert, this is one of those things that Jesus commands. He commands us to love our enemies just as much as we love ourselves and just as much as we love our friends and family. So for those who think, I've never heard this before, this might be a small wake-up for you, but uh, hopefully we're going to have something maybe ease us into that world of what it can mean to love our enemies. But you also might be on the complete other side when you think, why do I have to love my enemies? Uh, you might be like me. When I heard this question, I immediately thought, well, I, I don't know if I have any enemies that I can think of, or it's been a long, long time since I had enemies. Uh, I'm a pretty laid-back guy, and I tend to get along with everybody. Uh, you might be on that side of the camp. Well, wherever you follow on this spectrum, uh, we're going to move into this. We might even have some surprises. It might apply to all of us maybe a little more than uh, any of us really even realize at this moment. Kind of get us into this mindset of uh, many of us, not all, but many of us are comfortable uh, labeling the world or dividing the world into two camps. Uh, typically, this looks like an us versus them mentality. And as far as uh, having that you know, us versus them mentality in any number of ways, we might be doing this for any number of reasons. Uh, maybe it feels more comfortable, it, uh, maybe it makes us feel like we have control over how the world works or who we get to interact with. Uh, but also it might even come from a place of pride or even arrogance. But for whatever reason, we have a natural tendency to separate ourselves from people that we don't like or disagree with. Uh, you might think, uh, you might divide the world into, hey, here are people who are for me, and there are people who are against me. Or there are people that I love, and there are people that I hate. Uh, you might think, there are people who make my blood boil, and there are people who I would love to hang out with every single day of the week. Uh, just along those sides, you can even have uh, an enemy, you can even have an enemy and not know them personally. Uh, with the advent of and the just increased relevancy of social media and just the internet now it's been going on for a couple decades, we can easily disagree or even hate people that we've never even met. To get this even more personal, and we'll kind of end here more on the practical side, but we are obviously in the midst of a very polarizing health situation on a global scale. Now, no one is uh, arguing against the fact that this uh, worldwide pandemic is a very serious thing. But also, uh, even within our own households or in our communities, people are responding to this in different ways. Uh, you might feel that people are overreacting and becoming way too emotional about this. But you may also be thinking that some people aren't reacting enough. You might be thinking people are under-preparing, over-preparing. This is a time where naturally it feels easy for us to uh, divide ourselves. An us, once again, an us versus them mentality. Even outside of the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, this coming Tuesday, uh, it is a very big primary election. Uh, certainly, it is an election year, even though November is months and months away. Uh, we are bombarded with political messages everywhere we turn, be that on billboards, uh, on the internet, ads via Facebook and Instagram, or even just the nightly news. We cannot escape this, and it seems that we live in a world that likes to divide us rather than unite us. Even on that political front, you might be like me. I've already unfollowed a number of friends on Facebook. Haven't defriended anybody, but I've already unf unfollowed some people. You might be in the same boat. Uh, just, we just, I, for me personally, I like to uh, kind of steer clear of anything that might want to uh, divide me or separate me from uh, other people, even those that I love. Well, I, going forward again, asking the question, why do I have to love my enemies? Uh, here's what we're going to think through. An enemy is typically anyone that we are against. We don't even need to necessarily hate somebody, but if we say they are not for me, they are against me, I don't like them, uh, I think it's okay for us to kind of widen this understanding of what an enemy is. Me personally, I don't think I have anyone in my life right now that I hate, but my gosh, there are certainly plenty of people that I don't like. So uh, first, my goal is always if I can try and preach this, these sermons to myself, then hopefully that can uh, turn around and become a blessing for anyone else who gets to hear this message. Uh, but we're going to dive into scripture right now, and we're going to ask the question, what does Jesus say about loving our enemies or people who are against us? And this is from Luke chapter 6. Here we go. This is, these are the words of Jesus. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who hurt you. 
If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. That might sound familiar to a lot of us. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Let me stop and just say, wow, there is a lot, a lot, a lot here in just these few verses. Now, back in the first century, for those hearing this for the first time, because again, Jesus is talking to a gathered crowd of people. For those hearing this for the very first time that these words come out of Jesus' mouth, they would likely have gasped. They would have been shocked. They would have been taken aback. Because up to this point, even in church, even in the temples and synagogues, they had never, ever, ever been taught to love their enemies. Yes, over and over for centuries, they had been taught to love their neighbors. That has always been important. But already this is just one other instance of Jesus bringing a radical new teaching, loving teaching, into the world when he says, love your enemies. Jesus is turning the tables on how to live an others-centered life, which is at the core of the gospel message. So we'll kind of go through some of these phrases a bit by bit, even though we have uh, other scriptures we're going to play in a little bit later. But first he says, do good to those who hate us. Uh, the Greek word here is where we get our word for eulogize. If we have a funeral or a wake, there is typically a eulogy, and that pretty much is a, a uh, recounting of the good this person has done. So he says, for those who hate us, eulogize them. Say good things about them. Make, make very apparent the good that they have done. So already, Jesus is offering a, something that is very, very challenged to most, if not all of us. But he says, do good to those who hate us. And then he comes around and says, Pray for those who hurt you. And this is more than just a physical, uh, a physical pain. This includes uh, you know, those who insult you, those who mistreat you. It's not just physical. Even as far as those who hurt your feelings or damage you emotionally or spiritually, Jesus says, pray for those. Pray for their well-being. Pray that they will be blessed by God just as much as you are. Something about the context of uh, this time going on in the first century is the Jewish people there in Jerusalem and Israel, they were under the rule of the Roman Empire. So as far as seeing Roman guards and Roman presence, when people thought of enemies, they thought of Rome. And again, uh, they were in a completely different time. So we, we, when we hear right now the talk about people hurting us, yeah, we think about people slandering our name, maybe cheating us in certain business deals, things like that. But what they would have heard in the first century is just something about the Roman Empire uh, they did not have any problem with torture or even murder in order to keep people in line. So already, if you think it's uh, tough to hear this today, it would have been even that much more difficult to hear this command in the first century. But right now what Jesus is doing is he is laying down radical commands to love your enemies in a time and part of the world where some of your enemies could easily kill you without the law getting in the way. Just let us sit on that for a moment. It's a situation that many of us can never and probably will never be able to relate to. But kind of going back into some more things that Jesus says, uh, if you read back in the Old Testament, uh, there are actually some laws that Moses set up that uh, permitted a tit-for-tat mentality. Essentially, uh, if, you know, if you slap me on the face, then I'm allowed to slap you on the face. Well, Jesus is already updating that. He says, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, Jesus is preaching a non-retaliation uh, a, a, a philosophy here. Uh, the reason is, even though the law allowed for tit for tat or an eye for an eye, uh, that tended to escalate quickly. Uh, I don't know if you had siblings growing up, but typically uh, a slap on the face could easily turn into a just nothing outside of a full on beating. Turns out we are not in a position to really um, monitor that whole tit for tat thing well, and Jesus knew that. Uh, something else, again, going back into how Rome was set up. Uh, Roman army, empire, guards, soldiers, they were all around. And 
uh, Roman citizens, they had the ability, they had the law on their side, they could force just common citizens to help carry military supplies for up to one mile. Even Jesus says, if someone asks you to go one mile, go ahead and carry two. That's actually where we get to the phrase today of going the extra mile, going beyond what we are required to do. Turns out some of these uh, teachings that Jesus has has staying power even outside of the church. But in the midst of these few verses out of Luke 6, verses 27 to 36, Jesus' big message is this. Don't retaliate. Do not seek revenge. Now, there's an entire rabbit trail we could go on. Uh, this is not an absolute. Uh, Jesus is not saying be a doormat. Uh, I am confident that there is a time and place for defending others. I think there's a time and place for a just war. But as a general rule, Jesus says, don't retaliate, don't seek revenge. Elsewhere in Scripture says that justice is Lord. But again, there are certain instances, we don't have time to get into that right now, but don't feel like Jesus is saying, be a doormat. He is not saying that. But if you have questions, we can talk about that. Just send me an email, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, but just to kind of uh, get, at, uh, I just thought of an example of, uh, I'm not as gentle or as Jesus-centered as I used to be. Here's a reason. Here's a really good reason why uh, we're not. We shouldn't uh, be in charge of justice today, just on our own selves as individuals. I remember as an elementary school student, I was eight years old, and one of my peers, one of my classmates, has wronged me, and I was mad, 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 even angry. And here's what I prayed for. This is what the power and the anger that we can do when we feel like we've been wronged. I prayed that God would kill his grandmother. Thank God that prayers like that don't even work. That speaks to the level of what we can do in a tit-for-tat world. Uh, Jesus says, hey, revenge is not yours. Don't retaliate. Leave that to me and God in heaven. What Jesus does is he points us to what we know today as the golden rule. Here it says, do to others as you would like them to do to you. And this is also an updating of a law or a saying that had been around to this point. There was actually a similar uh, teaching on this front but the, both in the Jewish world, a guy named Rabbi Hillel, he came up with a good rule saying, hey, whatever you don't want done to you, don't do that to other people. It was more of a past or even kind of negative uh, viewpoint of this. But even that teaching even popped up before Jesus. You can find that teaching in Buddhism, Hinduism, and other ones. Again, it, before Jesus comes on the scene, the popular life, uh, life outlook was, whatever you don't want done to you, don't do that to other people. So that allowed people to maybe stay away from more of a loving, other-centered lifestyle. Jesus turns us around again. Jesus is in the business of turning the tables and having new radical teaching that people hadn't heard before. Jesus comes around and says, whatever you would like done to you, do that to other people. Again, it's, we've heard this today, but again, you cannot understand how radical this was in the first century, this coming out of Jesus' mouth into the world for the very first time. And this carries on. If you read in the book of Romans, we have another large chunk of scripture to go through. This is from uh, Romans 12. Here's how it reads. This is Paul writing. Paul says, Bless those who persecute you. That's wishing them well. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy for those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you but conquer evil by doing good. Part of this series called Following Jesus as a helpful resource on, a, on the supplemental side of things, Roger and I are using a small book by Henry Nouwen just called Following Jesus. And this is something that, we, uh, that I got out of this book that Nouwen says. He says, Loving your enemies is probably the call that is most central to the whole Christian message. Again, loving your enemies is probably the call that is the most central to the Christian message. And he continues, he talks like this. He says, I have noticed in my own life that people I don't like have power over me because I am always thinking about them. They preoccupy me and have control over my thinking. I find myself jealous, resentful, and vengeful. 
I lose peace. I am holding on to these people as my enemies. Loving our enemies is the way of becoming free of our enemies. We free ourselves by letting go, by loving them, by caring for them. Here's kind of what this means. Here's what Henry Nouwen is getting at. When we keep enemies, when we label people as enemies or those that are against us, or even if we are against them, because again, this whole love and enemies and hate thing, it is a two-way street. We are not always the victims. We have to keep that in mind. When we keep enemies, when we choose to label people as enemies or adversaries or even a nemesis, it means that we are excluding them from the love that we have to give. We are putting ourselves in God's position and we are deciding who is worthy of love and who is not worthy of love. Or even who's worthy of kindness and who is not worthy of kindness. Who's worthy of mercy, who is not worthy of mercy. We say they are not worthy of the love that we have to give. And one thing I have known to be true is I know that when we start seeing people as undeserving of love, then we start seeing them as less than human. And that is something that we cannot afford to do as followers of Jesus. Now what I said earlier is that we tend to divide the world into groups of people that make us comfortable. And usually, again, that is an us versus them mentality. But here's the thing about loving everyone, as hard and challenging as it might be. By allowing us ourselves to love everyone indiscriminately, we have, we have no worry. There are no longer any boundaries. There are no longer divisions. There are no longer any labeling. Just everyone is worthy of the love that God has first shown us and that we get to now show the entire world. We don't have to worry about who gets it and who doesn't. We just get to say, everybody gets the love that God has given me and I get to extend to other people. Now, as uh, Jesus ends this section of teaching in Luke 6, uh, Luke 6, he tends to borrow uh, from also the Gospel of Matthew. There are similar teachings. In Matthew's Gospel, it's in uh, chapter 5. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. But uh, in Matthew, it ends, the section ends, I think it's Matthew 5, 48, but don't quote me. It's just off the top of my head. But in Matthew, Jesus tells us to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But in Luke's version, it says this, be compassionate as God is compassionate. So how do these things line up? Now, in Matthew's version, it says be perfect. We know as humans that just living in a sinful world, being, in an, being imperfect people, living in imperfect situations, we can never be perfect. But that's also not exactly what Jesus is after. When Jesus says be perfect as God is perfect, he says be fully grown up, be fully mature, be fully complete in your spirituality. And Luke understands it as this. Being complete, being mature means being as merciful, being as compassionate as God is himself. Now, my goodness, isn't that a high bar? But yet, that is the bar that Jesus asks us, even commands us to work toward. Be just as merciful and gracious and compassionate as God in heaven is. Once again, this is a quote from that Noun book. He says, Jesus is not calling us to be morally flawless as God is. But he is calling us to love as completely and maturely as God loves. Here's what that means. We are called to live a life of indiscriminate, radical, and unconditional love. Is that coming through? Is that clear enough for us? So on the practical side, what do we do? In this, trying to answer the question, why do I have to love my enemies? I'll have a nice, uh, nice clear uh, bottom line for us at the end of the message. But... In the meantime, what do we do toward answering this question? Uh, one, and again, there's nothing profound or deep here, but it is radical. One is this, pray for your enemies. And maybe a good helpful starting point is this, a reminder that loving our enemies starts with reminding ourselves that God loves them too. Again, loving our enemies starts with reminding ourselves that God loves them too. So pray for your enemies. And as far as what to pray for, uh, it, it might be hard for us, but I think we can start just praying for their well-being. We can even start. We don't have to start with praying that uh, they have a windfall of fortune go their way. They can start with simple as, God, I pray that fill in the blank just has a good day. God, I pray that uh, you show up in this person's day today. This will be a journey for a lot of us because a lot of us feel like uh, there are people on our eyes who have hurt us, and especially when we've been hurt, it can be especially difficult and challenging to extend that. Spirit of forgiveness, even love. Jesus knows how difficult it is, but Jesus says this is possible. And not only possible, but there is blessing and joy on the other side of this. So it starts with praying for your enemies. 
and they can start with just a simple one sentence uh, as you're starting into this because again it's a journey it is a discipline but outside of that after we are praying for our enemies we can do this do concrete acts of forgiveness and service this is taken from that book from now on he says what words do we choose when we speak to a person we don't like he says we are still filled with anger and hurt but we say a few things to him or her that indicate our desire to restore connection with them even when we don't get anything in return. So as far as speaking love, you can even say, hey, I am very mad at you. I am struggling with anger, but just know I am trying to uh, have a loving relationship here. I want us to have a good relationship, um, but uh, my emotions might not be there yet, but here, let me bless you with something. They might be in financial need. You could even bake them a cake. You could do something simple, taking out garbage, paying a bill, whatever. Actions can go before our emotions. In fact, that's often how our emotions follow. We can start with concrete acts of verbal kindness, but also physical uh, acts of service as well. And honestly, as especially with uh, in the midst of this national emergency that President Trump has just issued uh, yesterday, uh, this is a time where people will be uh, really craving uh, a feeling of love and comfort. This is a fantastic time for us as the body of Christ to step into the midst of chaos and confusion and provide joy and a sense of calm and assurance that God is in control, even in the midst of confusion and people getting sick with this thing. So now is a great time to do this because people are tense and upset and on edge. So what we can do in the midst of this, not only in our family and friends, but also those we don't like and even strangers, but let's be calm in the panic, confidence in the confusion, help in the despair, and loving in the conflict. This is a great time to do this. Uh, let me end once again with a large chunk of scripture and then just a few things to wrap us up. We're, into, into the, uh, we're landing the plane now, as it said. We've heard this before. This is from Peter. Peter writes, Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insult when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, and this might happen, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then, if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. So, as we wrap up here in this somewhat abbreviated message, the big question of the morning is this. Why do I have to love my enemies? Well, a short version of this is because Jesus commands it. But honestly... That's not a very inspiring reason, is it? As true as it is. When we planned this series, we wanted to take someone from being a restless wanderer, someone who is a spiritually homeless or restless, to being a joyful follower. Here is a promise, and it's a promise you can hang your head on, you can take to the bank, you can fully trust this. There is joy and freedom on the other side of loving and even forgiving your enemies. At no point does Jesus say this is easy. But there is joy and freedom on the other side of loving our enemies. And as far as the bottom line goes, if you want to write this down, we're going to have it up on the screen. But here's the bottom line. Why do I have to love my enemies? It is this. And I'll repeat it. Loving your enemies lets you feel God's unconditional love for other people and yourself. Again, Loving your enemies lets you feel God's unconditional love for other people and yourself. With that, let's pray together. 
Father, some of us might feel like this whole loving your enemies is so problematic, so challenging, we feel like we can't do it. We might even be feeling that we have a hard enough time loving our family and friends. Well, one thing about being your follower, which we are happy and eager uh, to do, as, your, as we are your followers and you are our Lord and our Savior, uh, we want to model your love. Maybe we need to be reminded that we were once your enemies. The scripture speaks of people being enemies of the cross. Some of us might remember a time where we did not understand you and we were actively against uh, Jesus. We were actively against the church and we have uh, turned, we have repented of that. Maybe we need reminded first that uh, you first loved us and you first forgave us. And with that reality, that with your help, with your Holy Spirit, we do have the ability to love our enemies and even forgive them. So we ask that your help with this, not just for our own sake, but because we live in a time in the world where the world desperately needs your love, even those that we don't like, that we disagree with, even those we feel like we hate sometimes. So I pray that you take that darkness right out of our hearts. Help us with this, because again, forgiveness and, and loving our enemies, it's an, emotional, uh, it's an emotional situation in reality, and we need help with this, because we have been hurt, and we know what it likes to feel hurt. But also, if we have been uh, those doing the hurting, I pray that we can build a bridge, extend an olive branch, and pursue being at peace with everyone as long as we are able. But ultimately, not only do we want to feel your radical and unconditional love for ourselves, but we want to have and hold the responsibility of extending that radical and unconditional love to those uh, who need it as well. It's in Jesus' name that we all pray together. Amen.